welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Oh, see, that does it. Thanks so much. Welcome. It's so nice to see you here. We have um, folks on Zoom. And um, uh, for those of you who don't know us, we are the Humanities Research Center here. My name is Christina Stanchu. I'm an Associate Professor of English, and um, I'm just delighted to, to welcome you to our second event of the semester in the Environmental Humanities Speaker Series. Um, our speaker series this year, for those of you who um, have been following it, uh, centers humanistic inquiry to understand interpret and shape broader efforts to address this most pressing challenge of our time, right? And the broad field of environmental humanities or EH helps fill an important gap in sustainability and environmental thinking, bringing fresh perspectives and a deep ethical commitment to weaving equity and justice into all climate change conversations. I think Mark and Jesse have been to most of our talks, so just to give you <laughs> props. And so thank you so much. A certificate <laughs> might be possible. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, Professor Heather Davis's talk tonight Joyce joins in the great trajectory of speakers this year in the EH um, series. Um, and if you remember in September, Stephanie Foote asked us, what good can the humanities do in a moment of climate emergency? Showing that the humanities are especially crucial now because they offer us tools to understand the multiple histories and inequalities that have brought the planet to the brink of disaster. In October, we had Phoebe Wagner who showed us how speculative literature offers possibilities for what comes beyond climate crisis. Um, her focus was um, the subgenre of solar punk. In November, Kelsey Leonard of the Shinnecock Nation in the state of New York talked about indigenous climate change adaptation strategies, drawing on her work on coastal and water conservation. In a similar vein, performance performance studies scholar Bethany Hughes asked us also in November, how do indigenous people use performance to advocate on behalf of land and water? How can these performances invite individual and institutional acts of advocacy, protest, and repair for our non-human and human relations? And this really resonates with some of us who are working on the university's land acknowledgement now because these are some of the questions at the core of our work. Um, in her reading from her recent novel, The Seed Keeper, Dakota writer Diane Wilson also in November, talked about native resilience and food sovereignty, which was also the topic of a talk in the same series by Malik Yakini last week, last Monday, <laughs> right? Malik Yakini, the co-founder of um, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Joining this stellar group of speakers today is Professor Heather Davis, whose talk is titled Petro time, and we'll hear uh, more about that. Looking ahead uh, on May 1st, we will welcome to campus in collaboration with um, the Provost Lecture Series, environmental historian Bachiba Dimeth of Brown University, uh, whose talk is titled, Do Whales Judge Us? Interspecies History and Ethics. So please mark your calendars for our last talk um, in this series on May 1st at 4 p.m. at the ICA. Before I introduce Heather, please allow me to thank a few folks who have worked on making this um, trip to VCU possible. Uh, Rani Sisavat, our amazing administrative and communications assistant, with, without whose brilliance we would not do what we do. So can we give her Thank you. <laughs> At our last event, we've had so many events in the last two weeks, I forgot to acknowledge her. So I want to do it <laughs> double duty tonight. Uh, Jesse Goldstein, the director of the Environmental Humanities Labs, who has done so much this year to bring visibility to the series, um, and the College of Humanities and Sciences, our Dean, Catherine Gracia, the OVPRI, and the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Our speaker's remarks will be about 40 minutes, um, and then we'll take questions both from, from this audience and from those of you on Zoom. People are still coming in. Um, it, it's my pleasure now to introduce um, and to welcome to VCU Heather Davis, who, whom um, I just met. Um, Heather is an assistant professor of culture and media at the New School in New York. 
whose work draws on feminist and queer theory to examine ecology, materiality, and contemporary art in the context of settler colonialism. Her most recent book, a little show and tell, for those of you on Zoom, I'm not sure you can see this. Um, this is Plastic Matter. Um, it was published by Duke University just last year, and it explores the transformation of geology, media, and bodies in light of plastics saturation. Um, she traces plastics colonial legacies, environmental violence, and the dreams and horrors of modernity. As literary critic Stacia Lema put it, the book is, quote, invaluable for understanding one of the most useful, destructive, and disconcerting substances of the Anthropocene. Professor Davis is also the editor of the award-winning award um, Des Desire Change, Contemporary Feminist Art in Canada from 2017, and co-editor of Art in the Anthropocene, Encounters Among Aesthetics, Politics, Environments, and Epistemologies from 2015. Um, Davis is a member of the Synthetic Collective, I almost said collection, collective, <laughs> an interdisciplinary team of scientists, humanities scholars, and artists who investigate plastic pollution in the Great Lakes. And this year, she's a member of the School of Social Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Study. Professor Davis, welcome to VCU. Thank you so much, um, Christina, um, for that lovely introduction. And um, just for the invitation, it's really like such a pleasure to be here. I also want to thank Jesse um, and Ronnie for their incredible um, work um, bringing me here. It's yeah, I just I really feel incredibly honored. Um, I also wanted to uh, do a land acknowledgement, although I was told that um, that the situation in Virginia is um, uh, quite complex. So what I'm going to say is that um, I want to acknowledge the 11 tribes, um, but they're both state and federally recognized in Virginia, um, but also to just kind of point and highlight um, to the kind of ongoing histories of settler colonialism and how that has like always moved people around and, and how that's always been tied to the project of enslavement, which is obviously so alive and present in this particular um, place. Um, and to say that my presence here, I acknowledge my presence here as an uninvited guest. Um, and as such, I think that that carries with it a lot of responsibility to try to do the work of, of undoing some of um, these structures. So, you know, part of the reason why I always start talks with a land acknowledgement is in part to kind of ask folks who are listening um, to also hold me accountable for the ways in which um, I might be unintentionally upholding white supremacy. Um, so, um, what I'm going to be presenting today um, is a working paper. <laughs> so, I, I really, um, I really would like. I'm really super thrilled that you're all here, um, and I would really love um, any critical feedback that you might have on this. I'm really trying to trying to kind of sort through some of these ideas, um, and so yeah, I would love to hear where they're landing or where they're not. Um, oh dear. Why is that one not advancing? Okay, hold on. Sorry, hold on one second. There's a bit of a technical. Let's see if that, there we go. Okay. So time is not what it once was. The National Phonology Network has been charting the arrival of spring for 40 years. And this year, after the warmest January on record, spring arrived in New York, uh, where I live, 32 days before the long-term normal. And I would also like to point out that um, clearly they're making this kind of benchmark only on the basis of 40 years of data. So, you know, I think that what this points to is the constantly shifting kinds of benchmarks that we're dealing with, right? Um, this is obviously not news to anyone watching, right? It merely confirms what we've been seeing, the buds appearing on trees, crocuses blooming, nothing strange except for the fact that it's mid-February, making it feel as if the body no longer understands time, a continual disjuncture from time and place made apparent by the fact that seasons are happening at the wrong time. The wrongness of this is felt through the way that light doesn't match the temperature. The day, when the days are so warm, it's hard to understand why the sun is setting so early. There's a feeling of being out of sync, a disjunction between what the body has been habituated to expect and these new um, 
and these new conditions that we find ourselves within. Sometimes these shifts also happen extremely quickly. So the Sunrise Movement, um, unfortunately, I, I seem to have lost this image, but if anybody has a copy of it, please let me know. Um, but the Sunrise Movement released two images um, last year side by side of the same person from Austin, Texas. In the first image, the person is wearing a parka surrounded by snow. In the second image, the person is wearing shorts and a tank top on a sunny day. The images are imprinted with dates February 18th and 21st, respectively, of the same year. In the caption that accompanies the image, it reads, we experienced a span of more than 80 degrees, 80 degrees Fahrenheit in seven days. It feels as if time is being compressed, but in this compression and in its release, it is very hard to understand what the immediate, much less long-term future will look like and the consequences that this will have for all the beings on earth. So the relation between heat, warmth, blossoming and season is only one small, perhaps mundane indicator of global heating, at least in the context of New York. In other areas of the world, such as in the Arctic, these disjunctive seasons are having dire consequences as people can no longer read the land and the ice has become unpredictable. This means that snowmobile accidents are becoming more and more frequent and the barriers to being out on the land, especially for Inuit, are having long-term consequences on people's mental health and overall well-being. This inability to read the land, to read the skies, undermines the sense of location and knowledge of place that was built through thousands of years of careful observation and analysis. These are not the most spectacular moments of climate change, but in these moments of great shift and small accruals, we can still see the uneven consequences of climate change, where the sense of unpredictability of seasons has differential consequences, but are felt by anyone paying attention. So this paper started with a thought experiment. What would it mean if instead of understanding fossil fuels purely as energy, they were understood to be the compression of time, the time of the lives of ancient plankton and algae, and the millions of years it took for them to become oil, gas, and coal? What then would it mean if through the burning of fossil fuels, all of this compressed time was being released simultaneously? For me, this helped to explain the kinds of accelerations that we are witnessing around the globe, but it also provided a metaphor for the disjunctive, non-continuous time of climate change, the way that things are changing not just quickly, but unpredictably, with starts and stutters and lags and tipping points. So petrotime, as I'm provisionally calling it, describes an unruly relationship to time that folds and bends from the deep past into the deep future, where acceleration is a part of what we are witnessing, but where time is also plasticized, out of sync, unpredictable. How would understanding climate change through the lens of an unruly time influence or explain both the ph phenomenological and political circumstances that we find ourselves in in relationship to climate change. The release of all this time could certainly help to diagnose the, the sense that things are speeding up, as I've said, but also points to the untimely sense of climate change. It's uneven dispersion, right? So the ways in which this is not happening even evenly, some places are heating faster than others, um, but it also points um, to the sense of impasse or latency or pooling or stuckness, um, which I will elaborate. As Kyle Powis White writes, um, who we were just uh, speaking of extolling the virtues of, um, uh, climate change is about changes, alterations, transitions, trends, and patterns. Climate change then is about happenings that unfold through time. Talking about climate change is an exercise in telling time, he, he writes. What kinds of stories of time are circulating through climate change and what ways of relating to time or figuring time might help to help us understand climate change in relation to the ongoing questions of environmental justice. I want to argue here through this diagnostic concept of petro time that the ways that we conceive of time in relation to climate crisis have a deep relationship to the types of responses that then seem adequate um, in the face of ecocide. So the temporal politics of climate change is situated within the larger frameworks of a relation to speed that has come to characterize understandings of modernity writ large. 
So as Sarah Sharma identifies and complexifies in her work on temporal politics, what she notes is that the temporal is political regardless of speed. And she shows the ways in which modernity um, necessarily depends upon also these other forms of speed, right? These, this, these moments of slowness, these moments of lag, this moment of waiting, like all of these other kinds of temporalities. So in this um, paper, I want to attend to the temporal politics of climate change, thinking about the investments in the discourses of acceleration and the feeling of being out of time and what they might be unintentionally aligning with. I then turn to three other figures of Petra time, impasse, waves, and plasticized time to elaborate other ways of thinking through the temporal politics of climate change. So if acceleration might be the temporality of climate change, then Petra time is, uh, I would like to suggest, the, the temporality of weather under the conditions of climate change. We have to pay attention to that noise. <laughs> <laughs> Is a system alarm. Okay, um, sorry about that. Weather refers to short-term local atmospheric conditions while climate is the weather of a specific region averaged for a long period of time, as I'm sure you all know. So climate change refers to global long-term averages. Weather is the phenomenological experience of climate change. A climate change gives a longer term, but unlocated, abstracted, and often inaccessible view. Both of these perspectives are necessary, I think, to understand our contemporary condition, but they have different orientations to the temporal. With climate change, we can understand that although the atmosphere has warmed and cooled in the past, this rate of warming has not occurred. So the best scientists among us tell us within the past 65 million years, a, a kind of a really terrifying statistic. But with Petra time and emplaced and embodied time that is also about the time of weather, this increasing acceleration has correlated with an intensification of variation, unruliness, and with it a loss of a sense of a benchmark, which I indicated sort of at the beginning of the talk. So in some ways, this is about two competing ideas of time, one that is located in a universal chronology that exists outside of any actual location, material, or being, and the other that only makes sense in relationship to particular locations, um, or uh, yes, and materials or beings. Petra Time argues for the way that, as De Deborah Danowski and Eduardo Viveros de Castro write, quote, for some time now, it has been time itself as the dimension of the manifestation of change that seems not only to be speeding up, but qualitatively changing all the time, end quote. So if a sense of linear progressive modernist time was built in part through its reliance upon fossil fuels, then what we are witnessing is the unraveling of this time, a time that cannot hold. So I'm going to turn now to two prominent temporalities of climate change, the great acceleration graphs and the ticking clock. Um, so I'm, oh, sorry. Um, so I'm sure you've all seen these many, many times over. Um, so I hope this isn't too redundant, but um, one of the primary figures of the runaway nature of the climate crisis is what has become to be known as the Great Acceleration, a phrase introduced in a, at a 2005 Dellum conference on the history of human environmental relations and signified through these hockey stick graphs that depict everything from atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration to the expansion of McDonald's. Um, these graphs argue for the emergence of a disastrous modernity that undermines itself through its own logic of growth, which emerges due to its dependence on fossil fuels. They visually signify the unprecedented rate of change that is happening through climate crisis. So although these figures and framing of the Great Acceleration are incredibly useful to be able to understand the degree of destabilization that we are living through. There are also some perhaps unintended investments within uh, the framing climate change through this lens. Most prominently, it introduces a universal chronology as philosopher of science, uh, philosopher of science Bernadette Bensoud Vincent argues. Flying in the face of contemporary physics, as well as epistemological and ontological temporal orders outside of modernist conceptual frames, she writes, <clears throat> these kinds of this kind of universal chronology, um, one has to observe the flux of times from a distance to con conquer a gaze from nowhere and from no when. This outsider's position is a prerequisite to construct a unique timeline embracing phenomena 
from the cosmic scale to the molecular scale. So this all encompassing timeline has to be detached from localities and temporalities, end quote. In other words, it removes a sense of location, the way that time has different valences for specific materials, ecosystems, and places. The problem with this approach is that it obviously lacks the kind of specificity to be able to address ecosystems and their rates of change, to account for the fact that climate change is happening unevenly. unevenly. This means the term climate change can gloss over the ways that some places are heating faster than others, or that some places are more um, adept at the, the changes that are coming. Um, but the graphs aren't located in specific ecologies or places. They show a sense of gradual or smooth acceleration, a curved model upwards that depicts a horrifying, but in some ways also a comforting sense of predictability. The difficulty with this is that in specific ecosystems, climate change is happening through jagged, unruly lines and precipices. For example, coral reef populations slowly have slowly adapt to increasingly warm conditions until they suddenly do not. And we see this in the massive kind of bleaching events. Or carbon sinks absorb excess carbon dioxide until they really can't take any more. Or there is less and less Arctic ice until the seas be, become a terrible feedback system, pushing the Earth's mechanisms over an edge. Although the graphs are alive, alarming, the smooth, they smooth out some of the anxiety around climate change, making it seem as if there's a steady, if steep, incline, when in fact it's more like walking over a cracking glacier, not knowing when the next crevice will suddenly and almost immediately open up. So I'm just gonna switch to, oh. Oh. just press it twice. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Maria, sorry. Okay, so out of time. In Union Square, New York, and now all over the world and what you're seeing on your screen here, um, there are clocks that are counting down the time that the IPCC says we have left to drastically reduce greenhouse gas gases in order to avoid more than 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2100. The time as of February 25th, 2023, when I was writing this at 6.37 p.m., was six years, 146 days, 16 hours, 22 minutes, and 26 seconds. You can see we've lost some of that in the intervening time. As I was writing, and as you're now watching, um, the time we had decreased. I watched as the seconds ticked away. The climate clock deadline shows how long we have left until the carbon budget runs out, given the amount of carbon that is emitted globally. The climate clock's mission is to, quote, tell us what we must do by when. The clock conveys the sense of an emergency through a deadline less than seven years. It is meant as a call to action, to urgent action. So I'm deeply sympathetic to the project, to its goals, to its sense of urgency, and yet the clock itself fills me with a sense of hypnotic paralysis. Augmenting the clock is another panel next to deadline, as you can see here, that reads lifeline. There, a series of other numbers are shown, ones that could mitigate, amend, or revise the deadline clock. It contains the percentage of world's energy gleaned from renewables, land protected by indigenous peoples, and the billions of dollars dedicated to a global green climate fund. And that's all their language. Um, underneath is a ticker tape of news headlines that provides optimistic stories about climate change, such as, quote, the cement industry pledges to reach net zero by 2050 without offsets, end quote. So the now appears across the globe. Um, it's, this has been something that's been taken up all over the place. Um, as an urgent plea for comprehensive and justice-oriented action on climate change. This is perhaps a necessary strategy given how desperate the situation is, the fact that so many people and countries have been waiting for decades for climate change to be adequately addressed. I also really appreciate the sense of a multiple and movable timelines that are thoughtfully built into the clock. However, I also wanna point out that the ticking clock, again, as Kyle White writes, can also lead to a certain kind of foreclosure of possibilities where people tend to quote, fall back on taken for granted strategies without time to question how they were arrived at or whether they are even the best ones, end quote. So the sense of urgency of a ticking clock often instills a certain kind of panic that can foreclose rather than open to new possible pathways or allow us to adequately grasp a situation. 
If what we're after is climate or environmental justice and not just the mitigation of greenhouse gases, which I would argue are two different projects, um, having a sense of a wider range of options would seem to be beneficial. Rebecca Sheldon also critiques um, the linear framing of climate change, especially in relationship to a future already known in advance, which is how a lot of this circulates. She argues that these claims rest upon temporal framing of environmental threat, where the response that is generated is often one of a fixed and determined sense of prediction against a background of stasis. The urgency of action in relation to climate change in part arises because, quote, it reifies the future as an already known immobility um, whose arrival must be delayed, end quote. Sheldon makes clear that this mode of address does not always achieve the political aims that it intends. As she writes, quote, while the rhetorical persuasion is aimed at transformative practice, lodging the future in a closed system limits the ends of the change to an artificially delayed present, end quote. In other words, we foreclose the future in advance. We end up living in a suspended present with the future already known, where the future is only just this kind of mechanism of deferral or delay. Um, Adriana Petrina also um, kind of following this logic, following from the ecologist Stephen Car Carper, Carpenter, sorry, calls this foreclosure of the future or future already known spurious certainty, which I, I really love as, as a phrase, um, and, and which is uh, defined as an overinvestment in the possibilities of data prediction and the sense of a plan that can offer a certain kind of solace in the face of a measurable and terrifying change. But the reliance upon such certainty, certainty that cannot actually be generated, induces short-term horizons and often glosses over the complexity of climate change uh, situations. And what's super interesting in, the, in her book, Horizon Work, is she really shows the ways in which as you dig deeper and deeper into the data, it's almost like an endlessly receding horizon, right? The more you, the more you try to actually generate data, the more you realize that you really have no idea what on earth is going on. And the more you're attending to particular localized situations of specific ecosystems, the more the sense of unpredictability um, increases rather than decreases. Um, and I think that that is an incredibly um, important uh, way of approaching the situation. So the worry here, obviously, is that the response elicited both by the sense of immediate urgency and the future known in advance will lead to a repetition of the kinds of extractivist and colonial practices that have caused us to arrive at this moment. In other words, it seems as if we're stuck in an endlessly repeating present. Uh, sorry, I'm going to just try to get out of this and go back to the other one. Oops. Sorry, I can't see the, yeah, it is. All right, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Okay. So petroculture scholars, Imre Zisman and Mark S Simpson, writing about energy transition, characterize this repetition as impasse. Transition is an appealing concept. It seems to elicit a, a quote, orderly, measured, serene, reassuring response to the ragged uncertainties of climate crisis, end quote. But transition covers over the fact that when new forms of energy are taken up, and uh, many of you in this room probably know this better than I do, um, the old ones are not abandoned, right? Um, so even though fossil fuel use has skyrocketed globally over the past 200 years or so, older energy sources such as animal power or wood are still very important and in some ways haven't actually decreased. So historically and to date, energy transition has not so much represented an actual transition from one energy source to another, but has instead been an additive process. Therefore, even the switch to solar and other so-called green technologies um, do not in and of themselves represent the replacement of fossil fuels, right? The refla replacement of fossil fuels is an entirely different project that is about keeping things in the ground or about the, the kind of elimination of their use. So the expansion of green energy has often relied on unexamined relations to access to land, including um, the continued kind of reimaginary of the American West, um, as Hillary Angelo has recently shown in a, a really great Harper's article. And the materials for green energy in the form of various forms of minerals 
have led to an intensification of colonial relations and the continued plunder of the global south, indigenous territories, and the expanding traditional regions of extraction to um, areas such as the deep sea. Again, as folks in this room are probably better equipped to uh, talk about than I am. So this is the reason why Simpson and Zisman see the energy transition not as a transition, but rather as an impasse. They clarify, and sorry, this is a bit of a long quote, we see impasse not so much as blockage, that is an impediment to a given situation that requires circumventing or dissolving or overcoming. Instead, we understand impasse as stuckness, the texture or atmosphere setting the conditions of possibility for a given situation that irrespective of any overcoming of actually existing blockages, manages nevertheless to perpetuate the situation as it is. Impasse in this sense names a continuation of the same, wherein the overcoming of blockages cannot solve and may in fact compound the abiding stuckness. Genres of energy transition in the current moment operate in much the same way, less to provide viable means for a better future than to indicate our constitutional inability to imagine transformation itself and thus manifesting the condition of our stuckness, which is to say that existing genres of energy transition are all too often forms of impasse, end quote. One of the primary modes of this impasse is the ongoing and continued elision of the relationship between climate change and colonialism. Giving most of the weight to the deadline for climate crisis to be averted lacks an analysis of the historical conditions that led to our present moment, which is um, part, I think, of what is happening with that clock. There are also many different ways to narrate um, the emergence of climate change, linking it solely to the Industrial Revolution and the consequent large-scale use of fossil fuels, or as, um, as I would argue, linking it through a longer set of relations between humans and nature put into thought and practice from 1492 onwards. So many people have argued that the climate crisis is a form of impasse in the sense that it is a repetition of the kinds of colonial structures that have been carried out in this part of the world for over 500 years. Kyle White again has argued that climate change is less of a new event and more of an instance of deja vu citing the ways that early colonists to North America deliberately and radically changed the relationships to the earth, water, plants, and animals to mimic those of Europe as a means of dispossession and genocide. And sort of like in relationship to both our thought around this, but also the ways in which disciplinary structures function, Malcolm Ferdinand points to the double fracture of modernity and colonialism, where these histories are treated as separate, right? That you either study the histories of colonialism or you study environmental history, but rarely are those things um, put into conversation. Or I would argue that's only recently that a lot of those things are really, have really been put into conversation. Following from the divides between nature and culture, and yet the condition of settler colonialism was a mode of inhabiting that depended upon the cutting down of forests, the creation of plantation systems of agriculture, and the attendant enslavement of captured Africans and the genocide of indigenous peoples. So what Petra time um, seeks to articulate then, hmm, um, with this great unleashing of time is more akin to the time of the ocean, where multiple times exist simultaneously and the past that is not past remains in the present. Unlike the great acceleration that relies on a universal timeline or the feeling of being out of time that can elicit knee-jerk responses, this oceanic time harkens back to older derivations of the etymology of time in English. The noun tide from its Germanic origins originally meant time, to tell the time by tide means that you're connected to the shore, to the zone where the land meets the sea and to the pull of the moon. It is a way of being emplaced in time that refers to a specific location and a relation to the cosmos. This expansive yet embodied time is a figure of Petra time that connects to the deep past to particular locations. Tides can also carry with them a sense of threat. Um, it is important to understand these patterns for anyone with relations to the ocean, if you're going to go out on a boat or a kayak, um, because it's so easy to be swept away. Additionally, the tides can sometimes come with a buildup of the intensity of, of the waves, another apt figure for the reverberations of petrotime. 
If we look to one of the increasingly common occurrences of climate change, that is heat waves, this relation between tide and time becomes clearer. Heat waves are an instance of being located in climate change, feeling the effects of the disastrous outpouring of time, but a time that once it is released, doesn't just accelerate, but rather pools and builds and puts pressure on a particular system. Heat waves begin when the air pressure, um, when high pressure in the atmosphere moves in and pushes warm air toward the ground. That air warms up further as it is compressed and we begin to feel a lot hotter. The high pressure system pressing down on the ground expands vertically, forcing other weather systems to change course. It even minimizes wind and cloud cover, making the air more stifling. This is also why a heat wave parks itself over an area for several, several days or longer. Heat waves then are waves that don't move, that speak to build up rather than speed, to torpor, to an oppressive state of not moving. Heat waves pool and languor, but can cause crescendos and precipices of ecological collapse. The heat waves we are witnessing then are the reverberations of time, this great unleashed and unwieldy time that continues from the waves of colonization that reverberated from across the world. So as Zoe Todd writes, the seismic shock wave that has rolled through and across space and time is now hitting those nations, legal systems and structures that brought about the rending and disruption of life ways and life worlds in the first place. Much as Christina Sharp describes the ongoing wake of slave ships, the seismic shockwave of colonial earth rending is an ongoing epistemic present, and we envision the seismic shockwave as a reckoning, one laying bare the human and environmental injustice of the orders upon which our, our um, oops, sorry, uh, late stage capitalism when white supremacy are built, end quote. Waves build and build upon each other as in a tsunami coming towards us, or they move slowly and methodically encroaching, making sea level rise, showing how thresholds have in fact already actually been passed. Yet waves also tell a story about time as repetition with difference. They open up a way to both deal with the ongoingness of the past, but also the possibility of transformation. So the, the, the next figure I wanna think about is the plasticization of time. And this obviously comes from um, the Plastic Matter book. So what fossil fuels intimately related materials is plastic. Um, most plastics are derived from fossil fuels and their production, consumption, and disposal are a major contributing factor to climate change. It is estimated that plastics are responsible for approximately 4% of greenhouse gas emissions, which means that if plastics were a country, they would be the fourth biggest polluter after China, the USA, and India. There has also been a dramatic increase in plastic productions over the years, um, with no sign of it slowing, despite the huge amounts of environmental um, plastics uh, movements around the world. Um, and if annual emissions from industry um, by 2050 uh, continue in the same kind of path, by 2050, we are expected to, to see the equivalent of 615 coal fired power plants that, um, that would be the kind of emissions of plastic. There's an ambitious plastic treaty currently under negotiation through the United Nations Environmental Program with important calls from the EU and African countries to limit plastics production but we do not yet know what will become of this process. In the meantime, plastic becomes one, one site to more specifically evaluate the relationship of time to fossil fuels. Waves of plastic lap at the shores. I first became interested in the temporalities of fossil fuels through this work on plastic. Plastics, I argue, plasticize time. They are at once connected to deep time through their links to the ancient beings that make up fossil fuels, just as they are also emblematic of the relation to an elusive but enduring present. They are another example of the relation to time that Sisman and Simpson characterize as impasse or stuckness. For the way that many plastic products enter into um, our lives is in a brief and endlessly replicating present. Um, they are often only used for a month in the form of packaging or in the case of more durable consumer goods like clothing for only a few years before breaking or tearing. Plastic is in this sense chronophagic, a time-wasting and even time-eating material. 
The cycle of production and disposal compresses deep time into an eternal and eternally replicating present as we encounter the same plastic item again and again. Plastic encourages a fleeting time that can consumes time. How long plastic will be around for is an open-ended and highly variable question. Mostly, we just don't know, although there is good reason to believe that under anoxic conditions, plastic will last for thousands of years. The material does decompose through the work of mycelium, bacteria, exposure to sunlight, and mechanical action, um, but more often, plastic simply breaks down, getting smaller and smaller without changing chemical composition. In the process of breaking down, it often releases the plasticizers that are added to plastic to induce certain properties like heat resistance, coloration, or a particular texture. Of all the known chemicals added to plastics, over 2,400 are of concern to scientists, many of which are known to bioaccumulate, which effectually means that there's no safe level of exposure and there's no end to these chemicals. There is no kind of end to their life cycle. This is the problem that residents of East Palestine are currently dealing with. One of more than 20,000 hazardous materials transportation incident incidents that happen each year. PVC, one of the materials that was being transported, has been a documented carcinogen since the 1970s, and waste activists have been calling for it to be no longer produced, but again, we're stuck in this moment of impasse. So plastic plasticizes time, folding the deep past into the deep future. It represents not the condition of runaway time or being out of time, but too much time. Too much time until it might be safe to return. Too much time that will haunt for untold generations to come. It is a freezing of time or a forestallment. The sense of deferral or entombment, and entombment the stopping of time, was expressed by one resident of East Palestine in relation to her own house that had become, in her mind, a time capsule that we can look at but can't touch due to fear of contaminants. The chemical present mean that the effects of oil's haunting, its afterlife, are not necessarily immediate, but involve the manipulation in the future. Petrotime builds on what Michelle Murphy has called latency, referring to the intergenerational unfoldings and foreclosures of distributed reproduction under chemical regimes of living. It describes the weight between chemical exposure and symptom, the ways in which temporal lag, sometimes appearing generations later, distributes harm and renders the haunting of petrochemicals pervasive. For example, some endocrine disrupting chemicals are known to alter the gametes of fetuses, meaning that a person two generations removed could be affected by chemical exposure. As Mur Murphy writes, to be latent is to be not yet, a potential not yet manifest, a past not yet felt, end quote. Latency is the lag between exposure and effects within a regime of chemical reproduction, which necessitates a nonlinear accounting of time. So petrotime is an inhabitation of the earth by fossil fuels for millennia to come, but more immediately describes the invading toxicity in bodies, the accumulation or residence of toxins that don't metabolize or break down, and condition the ways in which people appear in the future. Petrodime describes the compression of time through the bodies of long dead plants and animals into oil. When burned or used in plastics, this geological compression of time is then unleashed, as I've been arguing. For although oil through plastic participates in the time-eating acceleration that characterizes petrocapitalism, it is also one of the main residues of this time through technofossils techno and petrochemicals that refuse to disappear and will continue to haunt and exist intergenerationally. The notion of progress and utopia, which subtended the emergence of plastic in the first place, once, is really, once it is unleashed, um, is the neat relation, sort of scrambles the neat relation between cause and effect or linearity. Time itself is plasticized. Petrotime describes this unruly relation to time that folds and bends from the deep past into the deep future as a kind of haunting. As the sociologist Avery Gordon writes, Haunting raises specters and alters the experience of being in time, the way that we separate the past, the present, and the future. Haunting and petrotime involves humans and long dead organisms that compose fossil fuels.
So due to the recalcitrance of plastic and its associated petrochemicals, it is deeply conditioning the possibilities of intergenerational time. The beings to come will inherit plastic and its associated legacies. The cultures of extractive capitalism and colonialism will remain a material reality for a very long time into the future, regardless of what kinds of political systems people or other beings might be living under. So plastic is claiming and conditioning future bodies before they are even conceived. And this is happening obviously very much differentially with black, indigenous and low income communities most affected. In this way, the ongoing ravages of capitalism, settler colonialism and the afterlife of slavery are being written into the future as a kind of settler futurity as Jesse Goldstein is calling it, um, eating the future just as they have ravaged the past. People and other beings will no doubt find ways of thriving, but the material enmeshment of fossil fuels with racist, classics, and colonial policies undermines, um, undermines these, these possibilities and materializes in these chemical legacies. So at stake in the continued investment in fossil fuels and plastic is a type of path dependency, a binding commitment to plastic manufacture and use, a manifest in massive infrastructure that, in the words of former EPA official Judith Enk, who is now the, the director of um, Beyond Plastics, which is a really great plastics um, advocate, or, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, that's not what I was trying to say. <laughs> um, flat, anti-plastic, you know what I mean? You know what I'm trying to get at. Um, <laughs> it's effectively looking, locking us into a plastic future, all but impossible to reverse or undo. Um, that outcome will materialize what Hannah Appel in her transient account of infrastructural time hauntingly calls a particular kind of infrastructural futurity that is more akin to deferral. So plastic embodies a complex material relation to time that bends the deep past into the deep future within a condition that feels more like an endlessly replicated present. And even in this discontinuous, contradicting, uh, vexing temporal imaginary, as Simpson characterizes it, the future of plastics are largely unknown. What seems clear is that attempting to map a linear progressive path onto these materials, even a path of acceleration, largely misses the complexity of their temporal arrangements and the questions of environmental justice that they raise. For example, our legal systems have absolutely no way of accounting for these kinds of temporal complexities, given the fact that a lot of the companies that emit these um, kinds of toxins out into the world often cease to exist within timelines of 10, 20, or 30 years, um, get, that get bought out by other kinds of companies, and therefore, how on earth do you think about the possibilities of intergenerational violence and accountability within the kind of legal frames and structures that we have? Clearly, this is like a massively, um, massively disjunctive. So just to conclude, um, the unleashed time of ancient beings is reverberating, pulsing, and bouncing off the world and building and building into various cascades and tsunamis. This time certainly has speed, but it also has latency, impasse, disjunction, and plasticity. It is important to understand the heterogeneity of time in order to keep a sense of a horizon or a path of wayfinding in Petrina's conceptualization. In her writing, she describes the sense of the foreclosure of the future as a form of settler time. So here she's, form, she's pointing to the ways in which our imaginaries are, are foreclosing the future. So in her writing, um, she says, um, settler time means being cut off from an ability to meet conditions where they are, or being at a loss of knowing how to even recognize the scope of the loss. I find this like a very poignant way to describe the kind of condition that we're stuck in. We don't even have a sense of what it is that we're losing. Petro time then is not necessarily about producing new or different kinds of futurities, although it might also be about that. But it is about inhabiting a temporality that is not only linear and hurtling towards a future that needs to be forestalled or avoided. It is about fully, fully accounting for what is present, even and perhaps most importantly, when that present seems to be diminished in order to grasp ecological phenomena as complex webs of interdependent temporalities. Petrotime recognizes the way that time has been irreversibly rearranged to the vast unleashing of time linked to fossil fuels. It tends towards settler futurity, but in its attention to complexities of temporality can provide a more detailed temporal arrangement that cannot be wholly captured by the lure of acceleration. So I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much for your attention. <laughs>
and Sierra and not some lethal ones. Are you starting the screen or maybe you maybe do I can start and then if folks online have uh, have questions. Oh no first. Thanks, Kai. <laughs> um thanks for just such a wonderful talk. And it's it's so generative. This is so I guess my question is quizzical, I guess, and somewhat self-interested. So I'm I'm writing right now about the time of revolution. Which is um, also anti linear in its core, insofar as like the very idea of revolution is a one hijacked from the sciences and some kind of yeah, is, is about a, a returning you know, in, in all these kinds of ways. Um, and historically, it has always been about resisting the enclosure of time by clocks. So um, for instance, the you know the kind of classic example is that the first strike in this country in um, in Rhode Island was a, a group of women who worked at and, and women and children who worked at a kind of wage factory. Um, went on strike, uh, the first thing they did was destroy the town clock you know, mm -hmm. um, in the early early 1800s. And so, um, and I know your work is really so attuned to these questions of parents and agency and leg and, and whatnot, and it doesn't have to go into the kind of derivative version of like time side of joint or whatever, but like I, I wonder why it is that or I'm, I'm quizzical about why it is that so much of the climate attention to of the plurality of temporalities and, and resistance to linear time seems to be so um, unaware of the history of resistance to linear time and, mm -hmm. um, and the, the variety of the the peoples have take, undertaken to um, to avoid and and lag and drag their own feet um, in some ways, um, imitating or inheriting what materials do sometimes, um, you know, but doing so consciously and in an organized fashion. Mm -hmm. And I'm accusing you of doing this. I'm, Physically wondering whether you feel similarly, or if you have other examples, you know, of, of how we might join these two conversations that seem to be just passing right. I think a great question, and I mean, I think that like um, you're, I mean, you know, even though you were very generous and kind, <laughs> and you're quite, that you're actually completely right. It's like I mean, I'm not, um, I'm not a historian of revolution. I'm not a historian of any kind, <laughs> and therefore. <laughs> Therefore, um, I think that one of the one of the um, methodological pitfalls and something like that is that is that um, the way that I've been trained is really to kind of like look at objects and then from there to kind of extrapolate out, right? Um, but I think that any of those two things would actually be really phenomenal. And one of the ways in which I think that um, a lot of that very kind of like immediate kind of immediate thing, the thing, two things that popped in my mind were both. Um, the ways in which, um, you know, like, uh, like a like an artist group like Black Quantum Futurism is really pushing back against um, the kind of normative frameworks of time and and really drawing on the incredible kind of histories um, of of Black pushback to this kind of normative framing of time, but also drawing the, drawing attention to how time was like literally used as a mechanism of control and in particular the kind of like lag between you know I forget the exact person you probably know of, of but there's like you know somebody who tried to sue um uh I guess their overseer um but um because there was a lag between when they were meant to be free from enslavement and when they actually were freed from enslavement and then how in that lag in that in that moment of 
of it not corresponding, there's both, there's it both, op it operates as this complete tool of oppression, right? And I think in some ways, the kind of lag that Michelle Murphy is talking about is also the same thing, um, but through materials, right? It's like this, this really profound tool that is forcing a kind of diminishment of particular bodies um, by way of this industry right here, which is in Sarnia, Ontario, right next to the, right situated directly on the Amtuan First Nation. And, um, and then in terms of the, the other thing that, that came to mind when you're talking is, and, and you know, you obviously write really beautifully about this, but like, but um, is obviously in the histories of all of the blockades, right? I mean, like, although you know, although um, I think it's really important to kind of uh, think about the kind of question of impasse. I mean, I actually think that, you know, the the opposite of impasse, which I think is it, that Sisman and Simpson point out really in a really interesting way is actually impasse is not sort of in opposition to speed, impasse is in opposition to the blockade, right? Because, because the blockade is actually the only way or I don't know, I see it as one of the only ways out of the situation, right? And that actually in some sense, what we need is the stopping, right? And so like, and what I mean by blockade is like, I mean like the, the wet sweat and like small tiny houses or like, you know, like all of the folks who have done like the North Dakota Access Pipeline movements, like all of the, all of the, all of the movements, mostly indigenous led movements um, that have been done to, to stop, to block, to, um, for different ways, or even in, in, you know, smaller scale artist projects where folks are doing things like taking um, a parcel of land that could be developed by an oil and um, an oil uh, company because it's sort of like on the pathway of a particular oil pipeline and then um, making like try and get as many people as possible to buy up this parcel of land so that when the oil company wants to try to get through that part that that piece of land what they have to do is then get the permission from like 1500 people right and then that becomes like they're not going to do it right it's like it's not going to happen so so I think that like figuring out strategies of various forms of blockade stoppage is interruption, interruption. yeah exactly is like is is like points, I think, both metaphorically and literally to the times of historical movements that you're speaking about, I think in really interesting ways. But I think that's a great question and uh, a really good invitation to think more about that connection. So I really appreciate that. And I thought that I think this might be, I'm not totally sure, a sort of follow-up. And I was um, pleased to hear you again talk about impasse here largely and the problem of the foreclosure of a future other than one in which a colonial project doesn't continue to infect, you might say. And I just wondered if you been doing this work, because I you know at least listening to you talk about the problem of black, we're all familiar with lots of aspects of it. It's really a sense of, of breaking this impasse. So I guess I'm just sort of wondering, and as you're doing this work, like, you want to ask me, like, where do you find? I don't know how to use the word like hope, maybe that's too much. But something that, you know, in, in terms of the investigation of time, and you said you can speak to a little bit in terms of these like you know, blockades and so on and so forth. If that, in terms of your understanding of kind of what might shatter this perpetual present that will be extended into the future, too, or I'm looking for hope. I, you know, as you pointed out, it's absolutely the case, right? Fossil fuel production continues to increase, plastic production. Yeah. And so we've got all these interventions, but largely, I mean, I also want to say entirely insufficient at this point. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that that's the reason why, for me, um, the way in which Adriana Petrina formulates the question of the horizon is actually really fascinating to me. Um, you know, like, because she talks about not being, not like holding open, like not like finding a path so that we can necessarily arrive at some kind of like, you know, utopian future. I mean, I guess like, you know, Kyle would actually really love to hear your thoughts about like, you know, like what does revolution mean under these kinds of conditions, right? Um, like, what is that, what is that possibility for transformation or upheaval, given the fact that so much has already been conditioned and will be conditioned for, for, for many hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of years into the future? Um, 
So I think that in some sense, I feel like what our job is, is to fully account for the present. And by that, I don't mean in the sense of the impasse, right? By that, I mean in the sense of actually paying attention to really what is actually happening, right? Like, so for example, like to give a maybe more concrete example, because um, I realized the talk didn't have a lot of them and I need to, I need to kind of go back and put some in, but, um, but it is, um, you know, in the case of the coral reefs, right? Like, so, you know, we all saw those like headlines that were going around that said like all coral reefs will die up by 2050, right? But when you actually talk to coral reef scientists, what's happening is a much more complex picture. So there's corals that are growing in, in mangrove groves now, which historically has never happened, right? This is the first time anybody has ever seen this happening. Um, the, the kind of decimation of the coral reefs is, is real, but what is sort of happening is that the corals, the type of corals um, that, are, that are surviving are the ones that are a bit more weedy, right? So they're not necessarily building those kinds of beautiful calcified structures, but they are they are they are surviving, right? In these other kinds of forms. So I think that um, you know, and there's all of this kind of une unexpected moments. I think is like you know because there is this kind of prediction model that says X next will definitively happen, right? And of course, that you know that's dependent upon uh, carbon dioxide outputs, but it also really greenhouse gas outputs. But it also, I think, it depends upon a lack of knowledge of particular kind of ecosystem behavior, right? And I think that what she's trying to um, invite us to do, what I would agree with, is like is to pay attention to those moments of survival in weird forms, in uh, joy or things that are occurring regardless of the state to like pay attention to the fact that resistance is something right like to pay attention like like to, to and like and in some ways I think that this is you know for a long time I like you know maybe not in the most like well thought out academic way but like but like I really I really hate like true apocalyptic um scenarios and the reason why is because it to me it just seems way too easy. First of all, it's like it's not like there's going to be some kind of like neat linear narrative structure where we all just like end up going extinct and that's that, right? It's like it's like that just feels so irritating to me because it just like it feels like it's skipping over all of the questions of ethics and accountability that have always been the questions for life on Earth, right? So like in some ways, it's like it's not that the, the conditions that we're living under are not like. Uh, completely kind of catastrophic or like or um earth rending in this way that I think has not been seen before even though there's like very clear historical precedent um but rather that that um that we've always we we're always going to go extinct right like humans are not never going to last forever that was never going to be the, the situation <laughs> and so it's like we always have only ever had to be accountable for ourselves to each other and to the world that we live in. And so it's like, that's what I think what I mean about being fully accountable to the present. It's like, it's not in the sense of like impasse, but in the sense of being like, we've always had to be fully accountable to each other and the world that we live in. And that condition has not changed. In fact, in some ways, I think it's intensified under these. So that that's what I would say. I don't know if that's hopeful. <laughs> The right word, and I'm not sure, but I think it's like paying attention to ongoingness as a form of resistance. So, like, there's something about the unpredictability of our situation that maybe also opens the possibility for new things to be done. Yes. Or other things to be done, I should say. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I think that that's one thing that I, um, yeah, I think that that's one thing that I really, I really have like learned in a lot of this literature. Yeah, yeah, this is a, this is a great conversation. Um, I, you know, future uh, time is is not a hopeful framework, right? It's not very. It's it's not hopeful. So my question, um, you know, um, to you about temporality and imagining. Um, time is about how do other conceptions of time, especially you know indigenous understandings of time, help us rethink this hopelessness, or you know just just rethink the future in a sense, right? If you think like the seven generations, right? Thinking about the present in terms of the future already, this is embedded right in this 
present, right? In this native present. How those conceptions of time help us this framework, but, but make it complicated? And I think Mark Mark uh, Mark Rifkin talks about this idea of um, you know indigenous time and beyond settler time, like because indigenous people have been relegated to this past, right? How do they reclaim sovereign the sovereignty of the present, right? Mm -hmm. So they can imagine the future. I don't know if this, is, but because you mentioned settler colonialism, and because this is obviously part of all of this, um, I I was wondering if, if you have any thought where this might as you know the project develops yeah i mean i think that's a really great question i mean i also think so deeply ironic about the ways in which like settler colonialism proceeds which is like which is the complete kind of like attempted attempted complete decimation of indigenous knowledge and life worlds and then at the moment of total disaster we're like oh but actually could you could you get us out of this mess <laughs> you know <laughs> I'm not saying that that's what you suggested, but I'm just saying like in my mind there's something there's something about that that's happening, right? And I don't want to I don't want to then by saying that I don't want to say like I don't want to undermine the importance of centering those things or importance of centering indigenous sovereignty, right? Um, but I do think that there's something about actually being like okay, we actually have to have to as a white like European descendant settler colonizer, um, I feel like from the place where I'm situated, what, is, what the most important thing to do is to like then make room or figure out a way to make room or seed space for that to emerge rather than rather than necessarily doing that work myself, right? Um, but I would also say that, um, that I think that, um, you know, I think that one of the things that's been so like deep and profound about uh, what, you know, so many people around the world have sort of said in relationship to climate change, which is that the kind of existential crisis of climate change is something that is really hitting white people, right? Because, because it is this kind of reverberation that has already been happening in so many places, right? And I think especially on this continent in relationship to the largest um, mass death outside of maybe the Black death that's ever happened in the whole history of, of the world was the genocide of indigenous folks here, right? And then in addition to that, then you have the total life ending, life, life <laughs> ending processes of remaking an entire people through the project of, of, of uh, slavery. So like, I think that under those conditions, it's like, yeah, there's a ton of people who have lived through the end of the world and the world has been ending for 500 years at least. And therefore, Therefore, there, I think in some ways what that does um, is create a certain sense of breathing room, right? Like that might actually be useful and necessary because it, it, is, it is a reminder that this is not a new condition. These are very old conditions. Um, so that, I mean, that's what I would say. I mean, like there's lots of folks who can speak really beautifully about actual indigenous knowledge, <laughs> but I feel like I'm, I'm not the person to do it. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of how uh, kind of wide, right? So that's no, 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 it's true, it's true, you're right. So maybe what I mean is that, um, yeah, you're completely right to say that. I mean, I quote, I quote indigenous scholars all the time. I've like engaged with some scholars of my colleagues and friends. But like, but, um, but I guess what I would say is like, is that I think that there was maybe a distinction to be made, for me anyway, conceptually between Kind of an analytic that um, that foregrounds my own positionality in relation, and instead of um, necessarily just uh, assuming a knowledge that isn't my own. Does that make sense? And I and I and I, and I think that that the way that I'm that I work with, with those other authors does that, but. Um, disagree with me <laughs> tell me or you know also if you think of maybe that's like too that's an approach i'm also open to that uh, open to that suggestion yeah um thanks so this has been really fun to think with and um i have a lot of thoughts but um the thing that i'm curious how you feel about is like i'm just thinking even just like well hey i will say i really like how petro time gets first articulated within the context of your work on plastic. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I like about it coming up there is the attentiveness to the production of plastic. 
and therefore the production of petrothion, which in some ways goes back to Kai's sort of, in a weird way, goes back to Kai's comment, which is like, there's an industrial infrastructure that's making petro to therefore make petrothion in some ways. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the, the productive, the, the, the constructedness, the productiveness, like there's an industrial infrastructure of this temporality, yes. which um, comes out, I think, a lot in the work on plastic. And, and, and you get that real weird complexity between the repetition, the sameness, the like cup that will always return in the same form, even though it's a different cup. Mm -hmm. um, but then, and so then there's like an experiential level of petro time. And then you're folding in all these other levels of experience that I feel like, um, and not just experience, but of like the shaping of this like space time, which I really appreciate. And I guess I wonder like, when you think about this and as you play with your like conceptual framework, is petro time a singular container or is it a, a multiplicity of temporalities? And like, are you sort of reproducing that universality if you name it as one container? Because so much of what you're doing with all these foldings, I feel like is pushing against that. Um, and there's so many different layers of this temporality that I feel like you're asking us to disaggregate. Mm -hmm. Which I don't know, so that's one of the, just like one thought I was thinking of. And even just the very naming it as a petro time as opposed to a space time has its own sort of like interesting implications in terms of like, what does it even mean to allow time to be segregated from space? Which you're actually, which you're actually not doing in your work, right? Uh -huh. You're explicitly asking temporality in the spaces and the geological origins um, of its emergence. And so I don't know, it just, thinking about that as some of these like interesting ways that the theory and the terms can be played with. Yeah, I think you're totally right. <laughs> I think like, I think in some ways it's like, it's like that, yeah, the, the, the term really came out of the work on plastics, as you point out. Um, and then I have been thinking about it in relationship to climate change more broadly and like, does it actually offer perhaps these kinds of different um, ways to push back against some of the some of these kinds of dominant narratives about what climate change is. I mean, I do think there's, yeah, I think the space time thing, you're totally right. I do also think that you're right. It's like, it totally is this hazard of putting forward this other container concept that's actually meant to be a kind of description of, of a kind of multitude of, of things. Um, yeah, I mean that's a good that's a good question. And like, so does it even is it necessary to hold that as a concept? I mean, I think like I think for me the reason why I feel attached to it in the present moment, um, which I may not is uh, is just because it does feel like you know like I'm always a bit I'm always a bit hesitant. To like, oh, say that, you know, like, oh, there's this definitive kind of like, you know, uh, definitive break, right, in terms of, in terms of time, time, time periods of time frames, because in part of the kind of like reverberations that we're seeing. And yet at the same time, I think that there is something like, something completely kind of unprecedented about what we're doing. And I think that that is the reason for the necessity of the container still, right, is like, to understand that shift, that paradigm shift, to understand that kind of like regime of historicity, right? To like, to be able to, yeah, that's, I think that's what I would say about like holding on to it. But yeah, I think those are great questions. Yeah, thank you. No, what did you? Thank you for the lecture. Um, and uh, one thing I was thinking of, um, especially with this image and your sort of, um, uh, linking of uh, settler colonialism um, together with climate change is um, this uh, Dred Scott uh, performance that he did in 2019, an artist that uh, re-performed a, a 19th century slave rebellion, what's called Cancer Abbey, uh, and had this uh, filmmaker, um, John O'Conn Fry, film it, eventually made this film installation. And the thing is, so you know, you see hundreds and hundreds of sort of uh, black actors playing enslaved people marching through this landscape, um, and it uh, it sort of uh, sort of showed something that's as evident with their absence, um, 
and this is, you know, the reperformance of the history in order to do that. Um, and what's interesting is that the, the filmmaker constantly to like pan away from any like signs of the 21st century. Like he wanted oh. to, it to be like purely a 19th century. Fred Scott was interested in performance was like, no, that's the whole point was to see this through line, you know? Um, and it's just interesting um, to me, just to, I was thinking about as you were talking about that, it was kind of a certain kind of, of, of Petra time. I think, especially when you brought up Christina the wake and wake work that like the, the well, wake work that you're talking about, like in Petra time function of, of racism too as well. Yeah, that's an amazing yeah. example. I didn't know. I, mean, I know, I know, I've seen some of the, or some of the, I have actually seen it in real life, but I've seen some of the, um, uh, uh, sorry, I forget the ephemera, that's not the word, documentation. <laughs> Some of his performances, yeah. but not not that one. That's an amazing reference. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that you're right. I mean, like especially, I think it particularly, you know, in the book I write about Moscow and um, you know, like what is so horrifying about that particular place is that it was this place of like of black thriving for so many years under these totally unprecedented conditions, right? Like, like it, it should in some way that that should not have been possible, and yet it was for so long. And then what finally undermines it the, is is um, this African company that moves in to, to build a petrochemical plant, you know, and it's like, and then and then uh, forcibly removes. I mean, uh, well, I mean, they were bought out, but I, but I would argue it's kind of forcible removal by way of making the land so poisonous that people can't stay there. And I think that you're completely right. It's like, that is just like the waves and waves and waves of the same kind of thing just like happening again and again. But what sounds really brilliant, like brilliant and pointed also about what you're describing is like the possibility of continuing even under those conditions, right? And I don't want to like fetishize, I like also worry about this kind of like movement and climate politics as a kind of like fetishization of resilience. Like I think that there's something important about like recognizing the ways in which things break and they don't get put back together. You know, people just like accumulate trauma and then they're just fucking trauma, like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, I, but, I, but I like, but there's also something amazing about the possibility of not just human, but like, but all like beings, like still the kind of ongoingness of survival of existence. I think it's deeply important to pay attention to as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm so interested in the ways that you are articulating temporal disjunctures in thinking about how it relates to. I, so I, I'm particularly interested in like white women's racism and thinking about white women's role in perpetuating racial capitalism. So I was thinking about the ways that your work connects to the, the ways that there's this impasse, like the temporal disjuncture between having impasses as well as this sense of um, yeah, just preventing conversations from moving forward. So like thinking about how an impasse can take shape as like institutional cultures enabling, uh, you know, enabling different forms of racism and preventing conversations from moving forward. So like smiling, niceness and politeness, like, you know, preventing that from moving forward. And then thinking about how that exists alongside, um, trying to think of the, the way that you are articulating time. So thinking about impasses alongside uh, yeah, I don't know, just thinking about how that, that functions in relation to um, institutional culture. So, oh, so um, this is, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. My brain starts to shut down at this time of the day. But thinking about the false sense of urgency, that's what I was thinking about, the way you're articulating urgency. So thinking about impasses and the false sense of urgency kind of coexisting alongside each other and complicating one another and yeah, so like you know, thinking about a false sense of urgency and the ways that the cultures of productivity, you know, shape, you know, like white women like snapping their fingers at people and being like, you know, extracting people's labor and things like that. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think that that sounds super interesting. I haven't, I haven't totally thought about that in a gender dimension. So I like, I really appreciate that um, 
that way to think about it. But I've definitely thought about this kind of twofold relationship between the kind of like urgency and impasse as like as how white supremacy really operates, right? Because it's always like, oh no, 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 we have to like get all this stuff done so that we can possibly actually do any kind of real change, right? Because everything is too urgent, right? Like it has to be done by tomorrow. It has to be done by next week. It has to be done by like whatever time, right? And like certainly I think that we over like really into systems, right? Which, like, you know, I mean, like, I think this Lawrence Grossberg who like has that amazing quote where it's like, it's like the culture of the, the reason why the university exists is to is is the most it gets the most effective de radicalization tool. Yeah. But, like, it's all these people and like maybe doing much more revolutionary activities. You know, sitting where else in here, like frantically reading articles that find people will read, and it's like yeah, so. And so I totally, and I think that, and yeah, which means it's like that urgency needs to impact, right? right? And I think that, like, that to me is like such a hallmark of white supremacist culture. Um, yeah, and I, and, and I think that's a, that's a really interesting way to think more specifically about the kind of gendered aspects of that, which I haven't been totally done, so thank you. Yeah, I was like thinking about you know, I'm not an environmental scholar, but I was thinking about the applications of what you were discussing in relation to the temporal disjuncture, just broadly around white supremacist cultures, things like that. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, certainly, it's like this book that I think is most really important, but there's also some things about it that make me really quite uncomfortable. Um, is Anne Clark Kaplan's book, and then she made a book on the trauma. And I think there's something important about the book in the sense that she's talking about, she talks about a kind of preemptive trauma, like a trauma in advance. So that like we're traumatized by this sense of the future coming towards us. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that there's something about that I think that's actually quite important to think about. At the same time, the ways in which she articulates it, um, she does it sort of at the very beginning of the book too. And it really has, I think, the kind of um, white women the hallmarks that you're that you're describing and I think it doesn't attend to the ways in which that trauma is really differentially um displaced right so it's like it's like it's one thing for you to be really freaked out living in Manhattan and seeing superstar Sandy and you're living on the you know 10th floor or whatever it's a whole other thing to be living in the Himalayas and seeing entire towns sink under the weight of glaciers, right? So I think it's like, there's no accounting, like, so, like I think it's also like some, some climate trauma is not in, it's not preemptive, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, been, it's been happening for such a long time. And I think, yeah, there's something about the way that she writes it that, that maybe falls into some of those pitfalls, even though I also think what she's doing is important and interesting, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. This is probably a naive question, but I was I'm thinking about, I mean, maybe I'm dating my thinking here, but within the last decade or two, the embrace of time beyond space, you know, as something somewhat helpful. And, uh, and so now I time in a more neutral way to uh, to bring time back into relationship to space because to me um certainly the material plays a, a, you know a really important role in what you're talking about if not space um so i'm wondering i mean i'm wondering where where time is as a concept in contemporary um thinking and theory uh, and what you know what you're drawing on yeah that's an excellent question um yeah, I mean, like, you know, I don't know if you're just thinking about this book, but like, you know, like, I love that Elizabeth Beeman book. Like, there's felt like there were so many possibilities. Yes. Is, you know, uh, thinking about different tem temporalities. Yeah, I think that's such a good question. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. I do think that there's maybe a move back towards like space time. I definitely think that you're right about that. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I think that's a really great question. I, 
equipped to answer it, but like, I, but I do think that maybe what I think that maybe actually what has been the things I have seen actually is move to like the pluralization of time in all of these different kinds of ways, and I think there's been like a real push in academic literature to do that, like all taking seriously indigenous ontologies, taking seriously like black resistance, taking seriously like you know queer temporal formations. Like I think it's like it's like there there's been there's been a desire to kind of undo that modernist time, right? In all of these different ways. Um, you know, I mean, but I do think for myself anyway, I think it's also important to hold on to the concept of non-reversibility. So, which might be, that's maybe like a, <laughs> like, you know, like in the sense of like, you know, like some people are really into like cyclical time, you know, and it's like, I don't want to, I'm not saying that um, that's like a, um, an epistemic, like ontological uh, way of approaching time that I think has deep value. But from, I think, from the point of view of thinking about temporal politics, for me, the, 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 the thing that I would want to hold on to amidst, amidst the pluralization of time or space time is the non reversibility of time. And thank you very much for sharing this with us. And thank you for coming and have a wonderful spring break. We'll see you on May 1st. Yeah, May but 1st. we should try that May 1st. Yes. Thank you. For